Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Pastor Rachel. If I haven't met you um, yet, it's a great privilege to have you in worship with us this morning. Um, as we worship today, we are doing so in a in the midst of a series called We Are Oak Lawn. And the beginning portion of this series, so the month of October, we're focused on what it means to be Oak Lawn individually. I am Oak Lawn. How do we take that on in um, personal ways to be a part of what makes up this larger body? Um, which, by the way, um, this body is is growing, which is wonderful. And I know as you come in, you might think, oh no, there's no more seats. But there are five right in the front. <laughs> now, Chuck's covering some and Greg's covering some, so it looks like there's three, but there's still more. So if you feel like you're way out of the circle, please feel free to come in. You will never bother me by coming up in the front. So There's also like lots of space to sit on the floor. So Wherever you want to be is okay. I just wanted to make sure everybody knew because you can't necessarily see what I can see. Some empty views. Well, not views, chairs. So as we go through this series called We Are Oak Lawn, um, we're going to be looking at different practices. And in order to look at these spiritual practices, we're looking at um, particular words that describe the practice so that um, we can be better together at doing things that help us be the church together, help us be the body of Christ in more powerful ways. I'm going to take this off since I'm standing here. So today our word is thanks, and um, the way that we have found these words is that we're, we're borrowing them from Brian McLaren, who wrote a book called Naked Spirituality, and, uh, and so in the mornings, on Sunday mornings, before we come to worship, we, we do a Bible study too, and we talk some about this, and we talk about the scripture that we're going to be using for the day. Steve, thank you for reading that scripture. I know it was a long one. It was long. It was definitely longer than typically what we what we do on Sunday morning, but it's important because in the Old Testament, this is a story. You know, it's not just a it's just not a one off. You can't just like take this one verse and say, and here's what this means. Because it's important to know the story. The story of God and God's people and how we how we got to this place and these instructions that God gave God's people for a reason. And so um, so as I uh, begin this morning, I want to start um, not immediately right into the scripture, but I want to start with the way that this book starts. I'm just going to share a little bit with you because I think it's a great teaser. Um, I think you're going to love the way this book starts. He was naked. In broad daylight. In church. He had taken off all his clothing in front of the local bishop, in front of his neighbors and peers, and in front of his angry father, he now stood before them all. I shall go naked to meet my naked Lord, he said. We know him as St. Francis. This young man, standing there, self-exposed, he must have seemed more like a candidate for involuntary hospitalization than elevation to sainthood. His father was a prosperous merchant of fine fabrics, an appreciating commodity at the beginning of the 13th century, when dressing up was becoming more and more essential for those wishing to ascend the socioeconomic ladder. He had accused Francis of selling some of his merchandise to raise money for a church renovation project. Uh, uh, sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> Since that fabric had indeed been sold and the proceeds invested in Francis's mission, Francis had nothing to offer in restitution, so he gave his father everything he had. His money, the shirt off his back, and the rest of his garments, saying, I give you not only my money, but also my clothes. In so doing, Francis stripped off this earthly identity and clothed himself in a more primal and primary identity as God's unclothed creature, God's naked and vulnerable child. What does it mean for us to be naked? I mean, other than the obvious. 
this book takes us on a journey of saying in order to find that naked spirituality, that stripped down version of who God has created us to be, requires some practice. Some practices. And one of those practices is giving thanks. Um, is living a life of gratitude. And so... Um, I think it's important to remember that the secret to being satisfied with enough is a huge challenge for us in this first world place we find ourselves in. But I think the secret is gratitude. The secret to actually being able to find yourself satisfied rather than being caught in this horrid cycle of never enough. Because everything around us wants us to believe that whatever we have is not enough. As a matter of fact, it might even go so far as to want us to believe that whoever we are is not enough. As Oak Lawn, I think we know what to say in the face of that. Bullshit. Amen. We do have enough. We are enough. Mm. But it takes some practice of gratitude to recognize it sometimes. When's the last time you offered a prayer of gratitude for your toes? Really? You take them for granted until you lose one. Or stump it, you know. <laughs> We do. We take it for granted. But as soon as it hurts, whoo, then you'll offer your prayer. <laughs> right? And you can take that then to your calves and your knees and your, I mean, every, every bit of what we have, we could offer gratitude for. But how often do we? And it doesn't end at our own body. It extends outward to those around us, those who care for us, those who love us, some family, some chosen family. The sound of a baby. How grateful are we for that? Amen. But just how much is enough? Is it enough to have the iPhone 10? Or do you also need to get the Apple Watch to go with it and the earbuds and mm -hmm. all the things, right? <laughs> I was thinking that last night. Yeah. Side note, my brother shared with me a YouTube thing about dongles that was absolutely hilarious. You have to go check it out. Um, it's it's a it's a it's a uh, not in English, this YouTube thing, but it, this clip is all, you know, excerpted so that you can understand what they're saying. And they are just falling out, laughing their heads off that in America they were able to sell us this phone that you actually have to have a dongle to use to make your headphones work if you already had headphones. Because they changed the adapter. <laughs> Trust me on this one. <laughs> but how much is enough? Do we have to have all the things? And then if we get all the things, isn't there something more? It's a spiral. Mm -hmm. It's this never enough vortex. Mm. But then Brian McLaren says this, he says, when we awaken to the addictive slavery of our contemporary never enough system, mm. <clears throat> we too wanna to go on a journey of liberation. <laughs> And we want to develop a humility of character, enriched by daily dependence and daily gratitude. True thankfulness for our daily bread. Our daily bread. Which brings us to our text. I think this text really challenges our sense of proportion. What is it to have our daily bread or our daily manna, as it were? It's not about how much we want, but how much we need. And the cool thing about this story is it's one of those stories that's true for all time. 
The story is not just a, a truth for the moment in the desert for these people, but I think this story has truth for us today. Not more than two feet out of the slave pits of Egypt, the Israelites begin their complaining. And I've heard this complaining. I know it well, and I know you do too. <laughs> this complaining is endemic among these people as they are basically creating this veritable motif um, in their activity in the wasteland of the Sinai Desert. And no sooner has the echo of Miriam's loud song of victory ceased resounding than the Israelites turn from a choir to a mob, demanding from Moses water and food. And the people complained against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And Moses quickly turns brackish water into sweet, wonderful water by hurling a God-supplied tree into it. And the clear announcement there is, I am the God who heals you. God provides and God offers this reminder that God is a God who provides. But the satisfaction with God's provision ends all too soon, and the grumbling crowd begins again. The entire congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by God's hand in Egypt, when we sat down by flesh-filled pots and ate bread until, until we were completely filled. But you have brought us out here into the wilderness to kill the whole assembly by hunger. Great. <laughs> this would be hilarious if it weren't so pathetic and whiny and annoying. Amen. <laughs> this bunch, in fact, never had pots filled with meat. Unlimited back in Egypt. As a matter of fact, we uh, read the story and and watch how these same people were struggling to make bricks without straw as they scrounged to make a living in any way they could. Besides, Moses made it abundantly clear to them and to Pharaoh that the goal of their escape and subsequent time in the desert was not, in fact, to murder them, but to bring them to the land that God promised. require some patience and some gratitude and some trusting that God is a God that provides. <clears throat> but in response to these complainers, rather than wiping them out, God offers them food. Just like God to supply what they ask, despite the horrid way that they have phrased the demand, God says, I am going to rain bread from the sky for you. Odd gift, right? <laughs> bread raining from the heavens. However, it is a certain one. And this divine bread is only good for one day at a time. Pretty cool, because that also um, gives an opportunity for God to teach a lesson. Mm -hmm. God does from time to time through the scriptures. And in this lesson, God says, don't be greedy. What I'm providing is enough for everybody. Take your portion for today. And so those who tried to gather more than their portion, it was the same as those who didn't gather enough, they all had enough. It all balanced out. And then they were warned by God and Moses that they must gather twice as much on the sixth day of this magic bread because there was none to gather on the seventh day because we need our Sabbath, right? 
Again, God saying, I will provide. But of course, some go out even on the seventh day, even though they were instructed not to, looking for a fresh supply of this gift of bread. But there is not any to be found. These commands are nothing less, I think, than God's basic instruction for right living as people of God. I mean, it actually says those words in our scripture today. This is instruction for right living as people of God. Yet this mode of living, living a life of enough for today, living a life of our daily bread, as later Jesus would teach us to pray, is nothing less than God's instruction for us. It's a test for them, as a matter of fact. Will they follow this test of trusting that God will provide? What's your grade on the test? I have to say that I fear I am in serious risk of failing that test living as I do, with great ease, in the face of those who have none. If we were to grade ourselves honestly, just how much is enough? Just how much is too much? Do we even recognize when what we have is spoiled? I think we gather so much, we can't even see the worms. I bet we have not only enough bread for today, but maybe for the next 10 years, hoarded up in our kitchen and our bank account. Do you see the worms? I don't like worms, by the way. I did clean out the pantry one time and found the flour that had been a little too far back in the pantry. Mm. Meal moths. This is something I really, really don't like. So just picture those worms stirring up around all of our excess. And suddenly begin to feel a little gross. Could that be the very thing that could compel us to follow the instruction of our God? I don't know. Probably not. I think you got to be a lot more than grossed out to get hit in the head with this realization that you can trust that our God is a God of provision. And when we look around and we think, well, that just doesn't work. What about those who really don't have enough? That's when I think we really have to start looking at how we are us and not me. You know, this is, I think, one of the most difficult translation pieces about reading the Bible in a Western society. We read everything as I, me how it pertains to this individual mentality. But nothing about the Bible is written that way. This is about us. This is about us together, and what are we doing to feed each other? If you look around you and you think, well, how could this be true, or how could this be a loving God, where I hear these words, but I look around me and I see people who are hungry or who don't have enough. Find a mirror. Because the answer just might be in your excess. Matthew, um, in Matthew, in the book of Matthew, it says, um, therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body or what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? 
Like the sparrow flying overhead or the daylilies blooming beside the road, we live within creaturely limits. And we depend on our survival, we depend for our survival on resources that are outside of ourselves. I know that may seem very basic, but I think we don't get that. I think we actually are led to believe and maybe convince ourselves that we can do all that ourselves. That we can be solely responsible for all the resource that we need personally. But as creatures, we are dependent on others for resources. We are dependent on God for resources that make life possible. And it's all interconnected. The air we breathe, the food we eat, the ground we walk on, all of this interconnected and interwoven in a way that should remind us that we are all dependent on one another and on our God. And vulnerability doesn't make us less happy. Relying on others does not make us less happy. Actually, Jesus suggests it actually increases our happiness. It liberates us from the addictive drives of a never enough system. When we can look around and see things that we need in others, it's not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of togetherness. It's a sign of community. I need you and you need me. Amen. And all the way around that goes, right? Jesus invites us into a kind of radical nonconformity, a kind of radical liberation from the never enough system that we are all caught up in. It's a heavy idea because I can't look at my house right now without being a little weighed down by the ways that I have gotten caught up in the never enough system. But I guarantee that every time I look at you right now, I think, oh, how I need you. And oh, how I love you. And I remember that that's exactly how God looks at us. Oh, how I need you. And oh, how I love you. May we be challenged by this message today of thanks and of gratitude to be a more thankful people and to know that that is the secret to happiness. That when we can look at each other and not compete, but instead say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That we can recognize the ways that we are loved and we are all part of a system of God's love sent out to extend that to others. Amen. Amen. Amen.